This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Once again, it's Mises Weekends. We're joined by a friend of ours, someone I'm sure many of you already know, Daniel Lacaye. He is an economist, a, a PhD, a, someone who speaks all over the world at places like the U.S. Fed and at Heritage and uh, travels around to a lot of different countries in his role as a fund manager. But Daniel, I think what's most interesting for us is that you're not an academic economist at a university. You're not an academic economist at a place like the Fed, but you're sort of what I consider almost a new breed of economist who's out there, kind of like Nomi Prinz, um, kind of like Daniel DiMartino Booth, in that you are reporting almost from the front lines. You look at companies, you look at sectors, you apply uh, uh, technical economics training and, and, and libertarian and Austrian thought, um, and you bring all this together in a way that's very different from what I consider the this dopey, credulous financial press. You know, when you watch uh, Jim Cramer talking about stocks. I, I, yeah. In other words, I think, talk about being an independent economist. Yes, I think it's, uh, thank you for that, by the way, because I find uh, it's great to be in such company, uh, according to you. But uh, the, the, I think it's very important to keep an eye on reality. And um, one of the things that happens when you speak with scholars, with people that that come from academia, is that they stick to, uh, you know, to the dogmas. They stick to dogmas that uh, the, the Phillips curve, mm. uh, the uh, you know the old-fashioned uh, Excel spreadsheet models, and the reality is a lot more complex. And as we are seeing more and more each day, uh, the economy is not just what we, uh, what the government is spending, what consumers are doing, how people are deciding to spend or to save. Uh, the economy is, is, is vibrant, it's changing all the time, and th there's an overlay that uh, academia tends to forget, which is the financial market, and, uh, and, that, and, and hence the reason why uh, people are so skeptical about economists and so skeptical about uh, mainstream economists, because while they exert a tremendous influence on financial markets, they absolutely and completely ignore the, the challenges and the, and the impact uh, of, of the decisions that they make in uh, financial assets and, and asset prices. Well, they also aren't very good at predicting things, are they? They kind of blew the, mm. the crash of 08, for example. Absolutely, because think about this. Academia, while, on, while giving a, a sort of magical wand type of uh, mainstream academia, gives a sort of a magical wand to monetary policy, to government spending, uh, a, a very aggressive level of, of direct influence on the real economy of uh, monetary policy and, and the biggest economic agent, which tends to be the public sector. Well, they do that. They completely ignore uh, economic cycles. Uh, they, they, most, most economists tend to, by accepting the fact that governments can um, and monetary policy can influence the way in which the economy moves, uh, it, they ignore economic cycles, and they, you know, because an economic cycle is an abnormality, usually based on uh, the assumption that there is a problem of lack of demand that can be solved through government intervention. And if you think about this, most of, most of, the, of the academia tends to think that all economic problems are demand problems and as such need to be sorted out uh, through somebody, be it the central bank or the government or both, that incentivizes demand. But and absolutely ignore oversupply, which is probably something that we, from the side of Austrian economics, understand a lot better, mm -hmm. because that actually, um, the, 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 the challenges of supply side economics and the, and the, and the excesses mm, are much more explained by the fact that economic cycles do happen. No? But it would seem that even today, a lot of fund managers, 
a lot of Wall Street folks and certainly a lot of professional economists really don't know much at all about monetary policy. In other words, they kind of ignore that side of the equation. Because we have seen, uh, I think it's this is the this is the third generation of traders that has only seen demand side mm. policies, has only seen expansive uh, expansionary policies, and as such, they don't see anything else. You know, I was having a discussion very very recently, actually forty minutes ago, on on Indian television about the challenges on the uh, Indian economy of the Federal Reserve uh, raising rates, and the answer by by mainstream economists is, well, the Federal Reserve should not raise rates. And you see, the the we have lived so, such a prolonged period in which every piece of negative economic news was actually good news for financial markets because it meant that central banks were going to right. push further with dovish policies. That uh, everybody sort of feels right now in uncharted territory because yeah. the only thing that we have seen is I've lived uh, six hundred rate uh, decreases. No, imagine so that. That is that is a big problem because it 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 clouds your perception of value. It clouds your perception of what is risky and what is attractive. It clouds many investment decisions, and it's a big challenge right now. But if you're a Westerner, or at least an American, and you're under let's say forty or fifty years of age, you've never seen fifteen uh, percent interest rates. You have no idea what that would even mean. Paul Volcker might as well be. Uh, from the 1800s rather than the, the the 1900s. In other words, we have we have entire generations of people in the in the in the world of economics and finance who have never seen interest rates in operation. Yeah, and more more worryingly, there is a a very large proportion of people who think that interest rates themselves are a negative. Yeah instead of an essential factor of, of, the, of the price of money and why money as something that is scarce and, is not, and, and needs to have a price as a reflection of risk. And it's so interesting because uh, at the same time, the same people that tend to say that, look, interest rates, uh, I have never seen interest rates go up and I expect that interest rates will never will never go up. Those same people have a very aggressive and possibly negative view about the real economy. And it's interesting because uh, while central bank policy has led so many people to be extremely complacent about financial markets and about uh, uh, risky assets. At the same time, there is something that doesn't doesn't click. Hmm? So you do see interest rates at zero, but you don't borrow more. Huh? You do see a tremendous amounts of money supply and and uh, and banks willing to lend you almost for anything. They don't even ask you, no. Uh, and 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 people are actually saving more. So so something inside is actually behaving much more intelligently than what they uh, initially perceive, no, by the by the by the current environment. But it is extremely dangerous because we we it, an entire generation does not know what is going on. Mm -hmm. But also. So it, shouldn't financial markets serve a noble purpose? In other words, de, uh, allocating capital to its best and highest uses, which makes us all wealthier and healthier and happier, and, and it raises people out of poverty. It, but instead, it, it, I think even people who don't understand technically, they sense that it's rigged. Hmm. They do sense it. They do sense it, and and it's and it's reflected in something that I find fascinating when I speak with clients. No, is that on one side you see equity markets shoot through the roof, and at the same time, uh, many of my clients they just want to be involved in fixed income mm -hmm. despite negative real rates. Uh, so they do sense that something is not is not is not right. But I agree. I mean, financial markets. 
do serve a better purpose, and it's and it's a and it's a noble purpose because it's allowing companies to finance themselves and the ones that do better to finance themselves at a better rate and to have more access to liquidity if they're doing the right thing. They uh, it, it is a way of um, giving a bonus or a premium to companies that allocate capital adequately and therefore create more value and generate better business and better goods and services for the community. And all of that, uh, it's distorted by the fact that suddenly central banks are worried about price, are worried about the fact that they don't worry about the fact that uh, uh, those those effects are created by by financial markets, that financial markets are serving their purpose, but they're worried about the fact that credit growth. They just worry about credit growth. They don't. They don't worry about what type of credit. They don't worry if a lot of that money is going to very high risk, high yield, no real return type of companies, bubble assets, etc. They just look at credit growth as sort of a a goal in itself, no matter what type of growth it, it is. Now, I remember speaking at the European Central Bank and saying. Isn't the European Central Bank concerned about the fact that 80% of uh, capital allocation in the European Union is going to recycling of capital? Mm-hmm. And they just didn't even, even know that. They, they thought, what is the problem? Well, it, it means that you're basically just churning assets between the same uh, parts of the economy, but you're not creating more and better uh, better goods and services and and, and 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 more productivity central banks are not talking uh, about uh, productivity almost at all they actually think that uh, low productivity growth is 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 some uh, is an abnormality that will be corrected through time but they're not they're not understanding that they are part of the problem uh, and mainstream economists for example almost never talk and, and in, in financial markets about money velocity, which I find fascinating because if you're actually seeing such an abnormal amount of money supply in the economy, money velocity should be an absolutely key factor to understand whether your inflation expectations and your productivity growth estimates are going to happen or are they going to be uh, wrong. No? Well, give us the central premise of your your most recent book. It's called Escape from the Central Bank Trap. What is what is the trap that central banks have created for themselves by creating so much base money and by keeping interest rates so low? Well, the the the, the central bank trap itself is the is the problem that is created by ignoring hmm, the impact on financial markets of the central bank's policies. Central banks believe that bubbles or that excessive valuation in financial markets are sort of a benign secondary effect or even a sort of, I don't know, uh, almost something that that you that you that happens but you don't have to worry too much about because you care more about inflation, growth, whatever. Um, and it is, and that is the trap. The trap is that on one side you ignore the uh, asset valuations and the and the bubbles that you're creating, and once they happen, you cannot normalize the policy because the impact of that uh, financial asset bubble is uh, would be so huge that it would have ripple effects on the real economy that you're thinking about. So with Almost with a, as a collateral damage, a sort of well, yeah, valuations are high, but that is supply and demand. No, I've heard this. I've, I've had the the opportunity of working or speaking with at least uh, three presidents of uh, chairmen of, of central banks, and yeah, valuations are high, but you know, who cares? Uh, it, it'll be corrected through time, and they don't understand the ripple effects that they have in the economy. Funnily enough, until they leave the central bank. Yeah, Ben Bernanke is now talking about the excessive valuations and his, and Greenspan as well, etc. So that is the trap. The, the book Escape from the Central Bank Trap is based on the idea that I've read numerous books, fantastic books about the um, absolutely atrocious role of central banks and why they should disappear. I've read 
numerous books about how great central banks are the best thing after sliced bread and that they should actually introduce negative uh, absolute rates and, and, and push uh, monetary policy even further. But, you know, I wanted to write a book that said, look, central banks are not going to disappear and there are things that they can do to avoid creating more and more bubbles that end up generating lower and lower growth and more and more indebtedness. And the book is yeah. basically about the challenges and uh, solutions that are feasible, understanding that central banks are not going to disappear. I, I understand the, the argument of why they should, they're not. So my point is to give uh, credible and feasible solutions in which uh, central bankers pay attention to uh, the, the the importance of financial asset valuations a lot more than what they actually do. Well, here's an example of one trap. If if uh, interest rates were just in the historical average of five to ten percent, that the the U.S. government would be in a position where it, where the single biggest budget item for the U.S. Congress every year would be service on that debt. It would be a trillion dollars a year. I mean, how yeah. how can they ever raise rates? Congress would have a mutiny. Um, well, Congress would have a mutiny. Absolutely. Obviously, low rates. Well, we're for um, that, by the way. We're for a mutiny by Congress or anybody <laughs> else. Uh, low rates are an incentive to borrow more. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, they, they present lowering rates as an opportunity to reduce imbalances, but they're not. They're an opportunity to pinch. Uh, and obviously, the, the most indebted and the most uh, the, 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 the sectors that have the, the most access to debt are the ones that are going to take that opportunity, government being the first. Um, the, the, the federal government definitely has a problem with the budget. Uh, the United States has uh, lived too long from borrowing uh, and with the false idea that is actually embedded in academia, you can read very, very thoughtful papers about it saying that the US government actually needs to borrow more because if not, mm -hmm. it, it, doesn't, it doesn't provide liquidity to the rest of the world and, uh, and that the US debt is actually an asset. Uh, a quality asset that other people value. Well, obviously, that is complete nonsense. Uh, it is a liability, and it's a growing liability, and it's the reason why the United States, like so many other countries, gets out of crisis with uh, weaker and weaker growth, um, growth rates, and the reason why uh, it goes from crisis to crisis much more rapidly as well. Crises have always existed, but mm -hmm. we have seen they're more and more abundant. Mm -hmm. They're not as aggressive as they used to be before the uh, before there was a globalized financial market, but it is true that we have more uh, number of crises and, and, and we need to, we need, and, and debt is, stands at the forefront of that problem. Well, let me ask you something that uh, Ron Paul asked Ben Bernanke. Do you look at gold? Do you care about gold? Does gold factor into your thinking as an analyst? Uh, it does. I do. I do. I do pay a lot of attention to gold. I don't pay attention to gold from the perspective that some people uh, do uh, almost as the true measure of money. Mm -hmm. uh, but... To me, gold is an important factor. It's an, it's an important factor because the price of gold reflects numerous things, uh, starting with, and not being only, for example, um, what are the real inflation expectations of the economy? No, the gold is an inflation hedge. hedge. Um, I do look at the price of gold all the time. But one thing that I think that people who pay too much attention to gold fail or, or make mistakes uh, by, by doing so is, for example, uh, considering that a currency is stronger if the central bank of a country has more gold. Mm -hmm. The key example is the, the Russian ruble. No? Russian ruble is a very weak currency, but the central bank follows almost Austrian uh, and very actually and very wise uh, policies uh, for the for its own economy. No, um, 
but this this is this is a clear for example dichotomy you have uh, countries in which the amount of coal reserves is high uh, russia uh, or turkey for example and their currencies are very weak their stock markets can be extremely weak and their uh, imbalances are actually important so i do pay a lot, a lot of attention to it but not as sort of like the pillar that mm -hmm. around which everything evolves more like something that sort of it's like it's like an anchor it brings you back to reality uh, when 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 things get crazy well one last question for you daniel you mentioned earlier dogmatism that's a charge that's oftentimes thrown at really hardcore austrians really true believers but the irony here is we're supposed to be the causal realist school of economics. How, how can Austrians do better? How can, I mean, obviously the short answer is be less dogmatic, but how can Austrians do better? And how, how can we get our views out there and, and, and let people know that, that uh, you know, the Austrian perspective had a, a lot to say about the 08 crash and, and might be valuable in the future? My biggest criticism as, as, as a follower of the Austrian school is that we don't provide solutions is usually the Austrian school is tremendous at pointing, <laughs> you know, at, at, at the problem and saying, look, you know, uh, so, so we look, we're almost looking at the, as the guys that, that are going to turn on the lights and stop the music. So get these people out of here. I don't want to talk about these people. Uh, they, they tell me that everything is wrong. I want to know more. No, I want, and I think that that's where we need to we need to step up because the Austrian school of economics was always about solutions. Mm -hmm. If we look at the at the teachings of Mises, we took at, uh, it was always about not just criticizing what was going wrong, but also about a, a, an entire model of economic policy that was better for savers for uh, the middle class. You know, I think that that's what we're missing, precisely in an environment in which we are seeing that maybe indirectly, maybe people don't know why, but they do get that something is wrong and they, they react against the status quo, the status quo by saying uh, we don't believe in central banks, we don't believe in governments, yet instead of going to something that is that is actually a solution to all of that which is which are the teachings of the austrian school of economics what they do is actually go to socialism yeah. because socialism offers xanadu offers you know party uh, offers uh, the music to continue to, to 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 play despite the fact that there's no turntable and uh, so the the I think that that's where we need to step up. I think that uh, what we need to do is to see more, uh, more articles, more, uh, you know, more, more comments in what we say is, look, you know, these are the solutions. If, if we think about this, the reason why the middle class is angry, the reason why uh, people perceive that they are not better off than how they were before crisis, etc. We need, right. and they sort of understand that governments and politicians, and they don't understand very much central banks, but they do understand that their purchase, the purchasing power of their salary is is lower. Is that we 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 offer solutions that make economies work better that don't have to go constantly from boom to bust cycles and that don't elevate the government to God uh, whilst at the same time protecting savers and the middle class. That's what we need to do, in my opinion. Well, Daniel Kai, thanks for your time. Uh, good evening to you in London. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to be thinking about and listening to some of these independent voices. You can find Daniel Lacaye, L-A-C-A-L-L-E, uh, on Twitter, you can find his book, Escape from the Central Bank Tramp, at uh, Mises.org. You can find it at Amazon. And I really suggest you follow his Twitter feed because it's, it's, uh, he, he's a very active guy and, and someone you ought to be following. Daniel, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.